gracious Heavenly Father, I just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. I'm just thankful for the access that you've given us to come together in this way and just study upon your word. I just ask that all the foolishness and the ignorance would be filtered out, but you would just seal to our hearts only that which is truth that you would have us receive. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com, and we've been studying together in the Epistle to the Colossians, verse by verse. And in our last study together, we had reached the 20th verse of chapter 2, if you've been following along with us. Colossians chapter 2, verse 20. Now, we've come to a, what I believe is a fabulously interesting passage of Scripture, not that there are other passages of Scripture which are not just as amazing, so I really don't like uh, that that inference. I believe that this is God's Word from Genesis to Revelation. You don't hear me say that Paul says this and Paul says that, and that we're, we're following Paul's train of thought or, or Paul's logic. We are studying together the infinite Word of the Sovereign God, and the author is the Holy Spirit. And what tools that he used to put it together is really of, of secondary importance. But there are passages of Scripture that I'm certain that become very precious to, to each and every one of us, and this is one passage that's extremely precious to me. So I'd like to devote much of, of this video to, to going over what we've seen so far, and I believe that is supremely important as we approach the end of chapter 2. We found in chapter 1, verse 15, that Christ is the image of the invisible God. If, if there's any seeing God, it must be in the person of Jesus Christ. No man has seen God at any time. He is the image of the God that we can't see. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. And secondly, we found that He created all things, but they were not only created by Him, but they were created for Him. And... We also found that He holds it all together, for by Him all things are held together. Without the Lord Jesus Christ, there would be no material creation, and, and it wouldn't remain. In my uh, mind's eye, uh, as I imagine it, I, I, just, I see uh, Christ simply opening His fingers and the elements melt with fervent heat. You know, science is concerned with that which holds matter together, and we know that to be uh, Jesus Christ. We're one step ahead of the scientists. We also found out that he did something in his death on the cross, that he created a union between us and God, a fantastic union. He made peace. He completely made peace. He finished that transaction. It's done. And because of that, we were presented holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in His sight. And do you realize, folks, how marvelous a truth that that is, that we are holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in His sight? I don't believe that one Christian in a thousand has come to realize that in his or her life. Jesus Christ died in our place so that we are wholly unblameable and unreprovable in His sight. We didn't get there because we did something. We didn't get there because we obeyed the law. We didn't get there because we accepted anything, believed anything, or performed anything, but because Jesus Christ died in our place. And you who were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath He reconciled in the body of His flesh through death, to present you holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in His sight. Whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man complete or perfect in Christ. Verse 28 of chapter 1. You'll see over and over again in the Word of God that we preach Christ Jesus. Yet, as I listen on the radio, driving in my Jeep and... Uh, and, and as I on occasion get to hear somebody else preach, I very seldom hear anybody preach Christ Jesus. What I hear preached in the main is human responsibility, beginning with your responsibility 
to repent and accept uh, uh, Jesus Christ, to believe in your responsibility, to quit sinning, to clean up the flesh, to clean up the old man, and that being your responsibility and uh, your responsibility to serve in that fashion. And folks, I'm not minimizing any of that. I'm suggesting to you that none of those are preaching Christ. Consistently, the Holy Spirit declares that we preach Christ Jesus. Now suddenly we come to a passage of Scripture that outlines what it means to preach. Warning and admonishing every man that we might present every man complete, mature, perfect in Christ Jesus. The first human thought that I see almost uh, universally recognized in the Christian mind is that we preach against divorce. We preach against fornication. We preach against adultery. We, we preach against tax evasion. We preach against the licentiousness, pornography, and abortion. And, and if, I've, if I've touched on uh, any uh, that are very precious to you, then I'm sorry, but that is not preaching Christ Jesus. First of all, I, I'm, I noticed in the Holy Spirit's outline that He tells us that in the Lord Jesus Christ there is great conflict. Oh, I will that you know what great conflict I have for you and for them at Laodicea and for everyone else who has not seen my face. Now, you can, you know, if you want, uh, revel all day on what a, a wonderful man Paul was and what great concern he had for these people. And wouldn't it be nice today if we had somebody like Paul? And I suggested to you that what I see there in that text is the heart of God crying out, it is my will that you know that you are surrounded by a great conflict. The purpose of that conflict not being that you might quit sinning. And folks, I'm not trying to give you any license to sin, but read it in order that your heart might be comforted. You haven't comforted my heart if you tell me I shouldn't do this, that, or the other thing, particularly if it's some struggle I'm in that I can't seem to win. What is God's great conflict for you in the gospel of Jesus Christ that you might know? Comfort. Why is that? Because His people are flooded with areas of depression and defeat, uh, despair, despondency, confusion. They don't know the comfort of God because they haven't followed the Holy Spirit's outline of spiritual truth. He wants you to be comforted because of that conflict. How precious are you to God? You're so precious that He paid an infinite price to redeem you and He presented you wholly unblameable and unreprovable in His sight and He wants you to know that. And He wants you to know that He agonizes over your comfort. We saw that in Christ are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. All of the treasures, the riches, the wonders of wisdom and knowledge are in our Lord Jesus Christ. It's not about being intelligent, not about a high IQ, not about you know uh, anything like that. You can know all the Greek in the world, folks, and go straight to hell. The treasures, the riches, the wisdom and knowledge is in Christ Jesus. And that, folks, ought to arrange our priorities. The purpose, the Holy Spirit says, is that you wouldn't be led astray with enticing words, words that sound good. And it is hard to argue against a good message on human responsibility. You know, shouldn't you do this and that? And of course, you can't stand up and say, no, I shouldn't do that this or I shouldn't do that. That all sounds good, but we're putting the emphasis in the wrong place. In fact, we're putting the cart before the horse. We found out that we received a walk from the Lord. You know, too many of us are like Peter, you know, Lord, what about John? None of your business, Pete. Dealing with John right, right at the moment. Your walk may not be the one you want, but it's the one the Lord gave you, and He wants you to know that. Whatever circumstances you're in, whatever trials you're going through, the Lord Jesus Christ wants you to know that He Himself ordained your walk. He gave you the, your walk. Folks, 
listen to me. My walk is not one God gave me, while your walk is not one that He didn't give you. You are who you are, you are where you are, and you are what you are because God put you there. Why do we question His love, His wisdom, His direction, His power in our lives, His sovereignty over our lives? We have received it of the Lord. We found out that God has assumed the responsibility for our growth in this study since we began it. God says, I'll assume the responsibility of establishing you. I'll assume the responsibility of building you up. I'll assume the responsibility of encouraging your faith. I'll assume the responsibility of teaching you. You assume the responsibility of being thankful. And folks, if you haven't started there, you haven't started. And there are, are, there's, there are hordes of Christians who have never touched, even touched this epistle. Never, never stepped one foot inside this epistle. If we belong to Christ, He has assumed these responsibilities over our lives. Our responsibility is to give thanks. And we were told to constantly be on our guard that we won't be robbed of, of this wonderful comfort and truth that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. Through a love of wisdom and empty deceit, and we were told that we're complete in Christ, complete with respect to the removal of sin, complete with respect to our identification with Christ, which we're going to talk about at the end of the video. And I do this review because that concept is extremely important concerning what lies ahead. Open your Bibles to Galatians chapter 3. The Holy Spirit goes through a summary of the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't you know the law was our child instructor to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by the faithfulness of Christ. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Then are ye Abraham's seed. What the Holy Spirit is saying, and, and I've, I have never heard a sermon on this, is the wonderful truth that the singular seed, seed singular, of the 16th verse of Galatians chapter 3 includes you. You couldn't be any closer to Christ. Buried with Him in the baptism. A spiritual baptism. A spiritual identification. Identified with Christ. I looked at three commentaries and every, every one of them said, this is water baptism. And if you don't have this, this isn't true of you. So, you know, you're not complete in Christ. Maybe, maybe that's why so many people are, are trying to be baptized in so many ways. You know, forwards, backwards, you know. Uh, sideways, upside down, sprinkled, who, you name it. Who knows what? You are not mature in Christ because you haven't been baptized in water. That is not what the text is saying. The text says we've been identified with Him in His death, burial, and resurrection. The text says that ye are complete in Him who is the head of all principality and power. The word baptizo is used in the sense that made sense to the Greek mind. You are intimately identified with Christ. And I've, I've suggested in previous studies through these epistles that if there was no sin in my life, there would be an intense amount of pride. I am complete with respect to sin. Any one of you who is bearing a burden of sin is not trusting God. You can't possibly tell me that you are under the guilt or the burden of sin and, and then say that you believe He's forgiven you all trespasses. If you have not accepted that forgiveness, then that's your problem, not God's. He says you are complete with respect to sin. You are complete with respect to the law which was fastened securely to His cross. The vision that we're to see there is that when anyone brings up law, God looks at the cross. It's finished. Done. You are complete with respect to the law. You are complete with respect to Satan and his hosts. 
Because of that, you are not to be put under condemnation. Don't let anybody do it. That, that isn't saying punch them in the jaw. Just don't let them do it in your life or practice. Oh, but Steve, it may offend somebody. You don't seem to understand that offense in the Word of God is to lead them into doctrinal error. Don't let any man rule against you as an umpire. Rob you of your reward, my Bible says. As though, as though you've run a race and, and someone disqualifies you. Don't let anybody do that. You're not disqualified. You can't be disqualified. Don't let the thought come into your head that you are disqualified. Every once in a while, somebody comes onto the, this channel or Facebook or other platforms of social media, emails, what. Well, Someone comes along and, and they begin to throw out law. Don't let it happen. Rebel in horror from any suggestion that we are under law. Any such concept. You cannot be disqualified. You are complete in Christ. In a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels. And if you look at the genitive, it means, it, it either means one of two things. That you ought to, that you ought to, to worship God like the angels do, or that people have an undue respect in worship for the messenger rather than the message of God. Now, some translators lean one way and some the other. I guess I lean toward the use of the genitive uh, there as an, an adoration of the messenger, whether it's Paul or James or, or Spurgeon or Barnhouse or, or Steve Sewell. Christians today, as in every age, they throw names around and somehow... Uh, they've chosen them as their heroes, you know, rather than the Word of God. And folks, I hope that my candle would be put out before anybody would adore this messenger above the Word of God. Don't believe anything that you hear from this ministry. Believe what you see in the Word of God. My Bible says, intruding into those things which they have not seen. The Greek says, taking a stand upon that which he has seen. As I pointed out, the word not is not there. Building his theology on his experience. He's an existentialist. He's one that learns by what happens in his life. He's walking by sight, not by faith. And I'm telling you that when you look at what happens in your life, you're looking primarily at error. I am not suggesting in any way that God can't teach you through personal experience, but it must be a teaching which comes from the Word of God it's only highlighted by the experience. The truth is in the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is in the Word of God. Puffed up without a cause in the mind of the flesh, not the mind of the Spirit. Reason for that is that the attention is not on the Lord Jesus Christ. Not holding to the head, from whom all the body, by joints and bands, and so forth. Let, let me review that very quickly. Believers in contact, members of, of the body of Christ, being ministered, passive participle, being nourished by God, and being held together by God increases, grows with God's growth. The genitive says it's God's growth. One that, that God has ordained and one that God brings about, and whether you like the way it looks from the outside, doesn't change the fact that it is God's growth. Now verse 20. My Bible says, Wherefore, if you be dead with Christ, if you have the authorized version, scratch out the wherefore. It's not there. If, at first class condition, since you died with Christ, or if you want to translate it in Greek, if you be dead with Christ, and you are, from the elements of the world, why as living in the world are you subject to ordinances? The text is saying that you're dead with Christ. Dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world. You are dead from the elements, dead to the elements of the world system. I read in Galatians 4 just last night, Now the heir, as long as he is a child, differs nothing from a servant, though he be Lord of all, 
but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed to the Father. Even so, we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth His Son, made of a woman, made under the law to redeem them that were under the law. Not once, folks, in a sermon on the radio, TV, book, YouTube, website, blog, have I heard anybody telling me that the world is the world religious system based on human merit. You know, the world is, is always jazz music. You know, smoking, drinking, dancing, beauty parlors, you know, painted toenails. I don't know. I shouldn't. I sure wouldn't want to hurt anybody's feelings out there, but, you know, you, you fill in your own blanks. But the world is always this system of, in Christian's mind of, of honky-tonk bars, honky-tonk tonk boots, scooting bars, and massage parlors. And, folks, I don't see that in the Word of God. The world is a system which will persecute you thinking it's doing service to God. John 15 that will put you out of the synagogue, that will put you to death offering sacrifice to God, thinking they're doing sacrifice to God. That doesn't sound like a, a bar or a massage parlor to me. The world is a religious system and you have died to that system in the Lord Jesus Christ. Since that's true, why are you deriving your life from that system? Why are you subject to ordinances? That's the biblical definition, folks, of legalism. You are not legalistic if you say to me, I, uh, Steve, I, I feel like I ought to obey the speed limit. Well, I do too. You know, we don't have any argument there. What if I don't obey the speed limit? Well, the state of Oklahoma don't like that. God says nothing about it other than the fact I ought to obey every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, but I'm never going to stand before the throne of God giving an account because I broke the speed limit or didn't have a seat, wasn't wearing a seat belt. And if that sounds brash to you, then you read the book. God is not imputing men's trespasses unto them. The state of Oklahoma is. I do not derive my spiritual life from the world system. The reason for obeying the speed limit is because I love the Lord, first of all, and, you know, don't want to go through the front windshield, you know, for another. And I'd rather buy a bacon cheeseburger than pay a speeding ticket. What are these ordinances? Touch not, taste not, handle not, which are to perish with the using after the commandments and doctrines of men. Let me try to clear that verse up just a little bit. They're the areas of legalism. Since you're dead to these things, why is your attention there instead of on Christ? Why do you preach law instead of Christ? Why do you live under law instead of walking alongside in fellowship with Christ who's the fulfillment of the law? That's saying that you're not going to carry any of that into heaven after you've lived your whole life under law. It's not going to heaven with you, folks. You've spent your whole life concentrating on the touch knots, taste knots, handle knots, and when you die, it's done. None of it goes to glory with you. After the commandments and dogmas of men, God is saying that these rules and the, these regulations did not come from Him. I want, to, I, want to, I want to repeat that. God is saying that these rules, these regulations, these commandments did not come from Him. And somebody says to me, well, Steve, isn't the Christian life lived by rules? And I say, absolutely not. Absolutely not. Do you have personal convictions? Well, I mean, I hope so. Yours may not be the same as mine. I won't judge you for your personal convictions, and I won't allow you to judge me for mine. I'm not going to change them because of you. That's not an area of offense, an area of doctrinal truth. Look at that. He, he changed. Therefore, I must be right, and a Christian ought to do those things. And all of a sudden, I've moved from the area of fellowship to law. 
Folks, you're dead with Christ to these things. The elements, the structure of the world system is something that is totally foreign to you. That's why you're so frustrated. That's why you, you, you're lacking peace, lacking joy. That's why you can't seem to get a, a mastery over the old man. That's why you are always complaining and worried and concerned over the fact that you can't seem to clean up that rotten old flesh. The flesh profits nothing. 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 You're dead with Christ to these things, the elements, the structure of the world system. You live in it, but you're not of it. In the world, but not of the world. Which things really do have a show of self-imposed, self-willed worship. God didn't will it. And folks, I'm not going to spend my life worshiping God in a manner which He did not will. This is self-willed worship. It's self-willed humil humility. It's rigorous control of the body, neglecting of the body, self-imposed control of the body. Fascinating to me how it seems that God could have simply stated one time in one verse in all the Bible, we're not under the law, which would have settled the whole issue. But you know, you'd think that would be good enough for us as, as Christians. You know, that the law was never even given to the church in the first place. But God goes to great lengths to expound upon that crucial fact in passage after passage after passage, epistle after epistle. And so many are missing that fact. Steve, are you saying that we, we ought to just let the flesh go? No, no, I'm not. God won't. The flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary, the one to the other. So you cannot do the things that you would. Folks, you can strive to please God in the flesh, but law only takes you down a road where that you pass through pride first. Then, then if you're blessed, if you're really blessed to abject failure, which, you know, that's, that's kind of ironic, isn't it? Those who have, have tried and failed are blessed. Whereas they would, uh, typically, you know, such a person would feel horrible. They'd feel like God had abandoned them and, and that their life was coming to an end. The truth is, folks, that if you've come to the point of failure, you're blessed. If you've to come to realize that law has no place in your life, Flesh, folks, is what has a deeply romantic, endless, flirtatious love affair with law. Flesh, law. They're married to one another. The flesh can commit both physical as well as spiritual adultery. In fact, that's the illustration given us in Romans 7. Wherefore, my brother... Ye are, my, wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that you should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. You know, you can say, well, you know, getting a new car, Steve, that's fulfilling the flesh. You know, a horse would be better. No, it wouldn't be. You get a horse, you know, and, and then you sit around boasting about the horse. My horse can beat your horse. My horse is higher than your horse, taller than your horse. My horse costs more than your horse, and you know. Look at the beginning of chapter three, folks. That's where we're uh, get. That's where that's we're getting ready to move into that. Look at the beginning of the chapter. If if another first class condition, since ye then be risen with Christ. Seek those things which are above where Christ sits on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. Set your affection on things above. That's Christ. Not on things on the earth. That's self, law, the flesh. For ye are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. 
These are wonderful, amazing passages of scripture that we're passing through, folks. I wanna thank you all for your continued support. I wanna thank every, each and every one of you. Uh, some of you uh, whom I've recently spoken to that are uh, from all parts of, of the globe. Uh, I've had some uh, great interaction lately with some very dear, precious brothers and sisters in Christ in some far off places. Okinawa, uh, young Marine in ok Okinawa, uh, and his fiance in, in Poland, in Germany. Look, I love you all, I truly do. I love you with, with the love of Christ. Until next time, rest in Him. Thanks for watching.